Good afternoon, we're Greenfeld and Solutions, and our project is methanol production via carbon dioxide electrolysis. Our project supervisor is Dr. Kubria, and we're really thankful for his guidance in this project. There currently is a problem with increased CO2 emissions, and as we know, CO2 is a greenhouse gas and therefore contributes to rising atmospheric temperatures globally, and therefore there is a need to reduce the global CO2 emissions. To this end, our team is focused on a process that aims to capture the atmospheric CO2 and use it to produce a fuel that could be used as energy. Our project objective is to produce 1,000 tons of methanol using direct air capture and carbon dioxide electrolysis. Now moving on to the design description. Our process begins by using direct air capture to sequester CO2, then create a concentrated stream of CO2 that is fed into the electrolyzer, where CO2 and CO are delivered downstream. Simultaneously, a second electrolyzer takes water and splits it into hydrogen and oxygen, where the hydrogen is carried downstream. The reactor takes the combined stream from the recycled stream and the electrolyzer products. The recycled stream contains mostly hydrogen. The separation unit is where methanol and water get separated. The importance of direct air capture is that it presents an opportunity to capture carbon dioxide from non-point sources such as transportation. In other words, this process is capable of mitigating climate change by directly removing historical emissions from the atmosphere. The concentration of carbon dioxide in the air is very dilute, just around 400 to 500 parts per million. That means the direct air capture method must be able to overcome the limited concentration while still meeting the design specifications. To do that, we are using the process of chemical absorption to separate carbon dioxide from the air. This process is performed using the sorbent potassium hydroxide to perform a neutralization acid-base reaction to form potassium carbonate. Air is forced into the air contactor that contains the sorbent, where it captures up to 75% of the carbon dioxide. However, potassium carbonate isn't our final product, so several downstream processing steps have to take place to obtain a product stream of carbon dioxide. This involves converting the potassium carbonate into pellets and subjecting these pellets to extremely high temperatures, which force the carbon dioxide to be released. It is important to note that simulating and designing the direct air capture unit is out of the scope of our capstone because of the complexity of the process. Therefore, Green Solvent Solutions concluded that process details such as equipment, mass, and energy balances will be obtained through literature rather than simulation. In this case, the pilot plant proposed by Carbon Engineering will be downscaled to suit our methanol synthesis process. We have two electrolyzers in our proposed multi-step design for methanol synthesis from syngas. CO2 electrolysis is an emerging method to produce carbon monoxide without the use of steam methane reforming. Water electrolysis for the production of hydrogen is a well-established technology and is currently employed in industrial settings. In solid oxide electrolysis, or SOEC, the electrolyte is a solid ceramic which can conduct oxygen, oxide ions at high temperatures but remains impermeable to electrons and oxygen gas. This electrolyte facilitates the electrochemical reduction reaction at the anode and the oxidization reaction at the cathode to produce carbon monoxide and oxygen. CO2 electrolysis to CO is an emerging technology with minimal industrial application, but is the subject of considerable innovation and is rapidly becoming commercially viable. For hydrogen production, we are using a proton exchange membrane electrolysis cell, or PEM. PEM has two electrodes pressed against a proton conducting polymer electrolyte, which form a membrane electrolyte assembly in a zero gap configuration. This membrane is selectively permeable to protons and is 100 to 300 micrometers thick to avoid ohmic losses. In PEM, water reacts at the anode to forming protons and oxygen ions. The hydrogen is formed at the cathode of the cell and oxygen gas is formed at the anode. Because of the lack of process specific data from the literature and limited access to simulation software that is capable of handling electrochemical reactions, the mass and energy balances for the electrolyzer stacks were calculated by hand using fundamental electrochemical relationships and the units were treated as prefabricated vendor packages. A steady state non-isothermal plug flow reactor was modeled in simulation software. The kinetics were programmed in the software and preliminary operating conditions and sizing were used from literature. This gave us a starting point for our design. From there, we used MATLAB model to perform mole balance and energy balance conversion calculations and temperature profiles, which allowed us to narrow down operating conditions for better optimization. Through iterations, we found a volume of three meters cubed was sufficient. We used a commercial steel pipe with an internal diameter of 49 centimeters and a length of 15.87 meters. 
With our operating conditions, we achieved 92% conversion of carbon monoxide, 91% conversion of carbon dioxide, and 54% conversion of hydrogen. The reactor uses copper oxide, zinc oxide, aluminum oxide catalyst, and requires a weight of 3,510 kilograms, which has a 20 to 60 day lifespan. The pressure drop through the reactor was calculated to be 123.14 kilopascals. This is a screenshot of our simulation for the separation unit. A separation unit is vital for the overall process as it separates and purifies our end product methanol. The unit consists of heat exchangers, two-phase separators, and a traditional distillation column. Typically, methanol is produced to meet specifications determined by the International Methanol Producers and Consumers Association. These specifications were most recently updated in December of 2015, stating that the methanol must meet a minimum requirement of 99.85 weight percent, which is achieved by this unit. The separation unit first lowers the stream from the methanol reactor down to a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius using a cooling water heat exchanger. Most of the hydrogen at this temperature remains as a gas, while the majority of the methanol water condenses. A two-phase separator is then used to flash the hydrogen gas and recycle it to the reactor. Hydrogen has a low volumetric energy density of 8 megajoules per liter, which makes it impractical to store and transfer hydrogen without additional compression or cooling, which would increase cost. Therefore, a recycle stream was deemed suitable as hydrogen is a feed for methanol synthesis. 36% of water and 63% of methanol, along with some trace gases, are fed into the distillation column. The distillation column separates components based on their boiling point temperatures. Methanol is separated in the distillate, while water is in the bottom's product. This column operates at a reflux ratio of 0.98, and O'Connell's empirical equation was used to calculate the column efficiency to obtain an optimum number of trays of 32. After comparing column diameters from different independent methods, such as hand calculations of F-factor method, VMG symmetry tower sizing option, and lastly, KG tower software, the final column diameter is 12 feet with the height of 70 feet. One of the main barriers for producing methanol using direct air capture and CO2 electrolysis is that for a power to methanol pathway to be a viable green process, the electricity needs to be provided by a low carbon source. The electrical capacity, cost, and emissions had to be taken into account. For example, let's compare wind power in Alberta to hydroelectric power in Quebec. The wind capacity in Alberta is 1500 megawatts compared to hydroelectric power in Quebec, which is 40,000 megawatts. Hydroelectricity is also cheaper than wind by two cents per kilowatt hour. On average, hydroelectricity also has lower CO2 emissions than wind power. We realized the wind power in Alberta did not have the electrical capacity to run our plant without relying on grid power to supplement. Therefore, we decided to have our plant located in Quebec as it improved our economics, decreased our emissions, and increased overall project feasibility. In order to evaluate that our goal of designing a green process had been achieved, we performed a cradle-to-gate life cycle assessment. We considered three cases in our assessment. Case A is a hydroelectric power process, case B is for a process powered by electricity from fossil fuels, and case C will investigate the possibility of our design being implemented in Alberta using wind power. In order to operate continuously in Alberta, the proposed design would have to incorporate a capacity factor, where it is assumed wind power is used 35% of the time and grid power is used the other 65%. From the graph on the left, we can see that when our design is powered by 100% hydroelectricity, there are significantly lower emissions compared to case B and case C, which rely on fossil fuels. We can also see that the majority of the emissions are a result of the PEM hydrogen electrolyzer due to its large power consumption. If we sum up all the emissions that are produced as a result of our process and subtract the amount of carbon dioxide that is diverted in the direct air capture unit, there's a net negative amount of CO2 for the hydroelectric case, which amounts to 0.81 tons of CO2 being removed from the atmosphere for every ton of methanol produced. Cases B and C produce significant amounts of CO2 per ton of methanol produced, even compared to conventional methanol production technologies. As one of our main goals for the project is to investigate the possibility of decarbonizing the methanol production process, environmental analysis was done on three cases. We concluded that the GSS design facility is a green alternative to traditional methods of methanol production when hydroelectric energy is used. After further consideration on location, we concluded that Quebec provided a viable location. 
A suitable location was found in Varennes, which is an off-island suburb of Moyal on the St. Laurent River in Magaretteville Regional County Municipality. Our location is off Route 132. Following property risk consulting guidelines, we designed an area for security at the gate and buildings are strategically placed so they will not be exposed to fire or explosions. The control room is where operators can safely shut down units under emergency conditions. There are several access points in and out of the plant site, as at least two entrances are recommended for emergency vehicles. Here we have our director capture unit and electrolyzers, which are all vendor package units. All of these units are placed at least 100 feet apart as recommended for process units with moderate hazards. Downstream from here, the process units become intermediate hazards with high pressures, temperatures containing methanol and hydrogen, Therefore, the reactor was kept 25 feet apart from other units. The small units here are unit block valves, which are kept 50 feet apart from other process units. The separation unit with the distillation column shown here operates at lower pressures and temperatures. Heat exchangers are placed 10 feet apart for easier access for maintenance, which are shown here. Five feet is actual recommended spacing. Pumps are kept apart as it is recommended to not group them. The flare unit is kept 300 feet from anything due to safety risks. The storage facility is kept far from other facilities due to many safety concerns, which depend on what type of storage tanks or pressure vessels are used. That's it for our walkthrough, and there's a link to our site for this map, so please feel free to explore it, as there are several layers that weren't shown here that um, include safety considerations. As seen in the slide, our net present value shows that our plant isn't profitable just yet. From figure one, we can compare the cost of purchasing and installing the different units in our plant. We can see that the water electrolyzer accounts for almost 50% of the fixed capital cost, and the DAC unit is also just as costly. Figure two is a comparison of the cost of utilities for each of the units. The majority of the operating cost is due to the usage of natural gas and hydroelectricity, where the water electrolyzer accounts for more than 70% of that cost. However, this is mainly due to the novelty of the electrolyzers, and with time, the operating and capital costs will be more economical. Not only does selling the methanol and oxygen produced generate revenue, but because our process contributes to net negative emissions, we are entitled to offset credits via the cap and trade program. The Quebec government proposed this initiative to mitigate climate change by deterring industries from emitting a certain amount of greenhouse gases, and if they do, the industries must purchase carbon credits. Therefore, Green Solvent Solutions can sell the offset credits to the carbon market and generate extra revenue. Further initiatives like these in the future that promote direct air capture could provide more revenue, making this process more econ economically feasible. In the next 10 to 15 years, many improvements to electrolyzers are expected as a result of increased interest driving research and development and improved economies of scale. For both PEM and SOEC, the operating voltage, current density, and cell cost are expected to improve. These changes would have impacts on the electricity required and the emissions, but would have the largest impact on the cost of the electrolyzers. Together, these improvements would increase the net present value by 27%. Green Solvent Solutions has achieved the goal of designing a power to methanol process that produces 1,000 tons of methanol per day that results in a net negative amount of CO2. Our process has the potential to divert 0.81 tons of CO2 for every ton of methanol produced. Unfortunately, the process is not currently economically viable. However, the 15-year projection for electrolyzer technology is promising. For our design to move forward, there needs to be significant improvements to electrolyzer cost and power usage, as well as additional support from the government for truly carbon-negative industries. Thank you to everyone for your attendance and attention. Please feel free to join our chat and ask us some questions. Thanks.